Hello everybody and welcome back to another true crime video. Today's video is going to be on the Scottish serial killer, Robert Black. Now I'm definitely going to warn you, this is extremely graphic and extremely heavy. His victims were children, so again, viewer discretion is advised. Also, on a final note, please pause to read the captions. I tried to keep the video as short as possible, and also you may notice that my language has sort of changed in it. It's just because I really don't want to get in trouble with YouTube. So thank you, and enjoy. Who was Robert Black? He was born in Grangemouth, a town in Falkirk, and was born on April 21st, 1947. He was born out of wedlock to Jesse Hunter Black and an unknown father. He was then placed with a foster couple as an infant. He was a misfit from a very young age, known in his school as Smelly Bobby because of his poor hygiene. He was prone to attacking fellow pupils and vandalizing school property. Black would expose himself to other school children. Black developed a deep interest in his private parts and also private parts of young females. Before he had even reached puberty, at the age of eight, he would regularly insert objects into his own private parts, which was a practice he carried into adulthood. Black was a chronic bedwetter, and he freely admitted to being berated and beaten by his foster mother each time he'd done this. By 1958, the tulips had both died, and he was placed with another foster family in Kinloch, Cleveland. He soon committed his first known attack dragging a young girl into a public lavatory and fondling her. His foster mother reported the offense and insisted he had to be removed from her home. Black was placed in a mixed-sex children's home on the outskirts of Falkirk. He regularly exposed himself to girls, and on one occasion, he forcibly removed a girl's underwear. Due to Black's disturbing behavior, he was sent to Red House Care Home, a high-discipline, all-male establishment in Musselboro. At this new location, Black was sexually abused by a male staff member for three years. In 1963, Black's new home would be in Greenock, and he obtained a job as a butcher's delivery boy. He later said that whilst he was doing deliveries, he had fondled 30 to 40 young girls when he discovered that the young girls were alone in their own homes. But none of these incidents have been reported meaning that he could have possibly just made this up. In 1963, when Black was only 16 years old, he encountered a seven-year-old girl playing alone in a park. He lured the child into a deserted air raid shelter on the pretext of showing her some kittens. There, he held the girl by the throat until she blacked out and then he attacked her. He served no time for the offense despite being charged with psychiatrists deeming it to just be a one-off attack. However, they were wrong. Many more attacks would continue. A few years later, when Black was 19, he was evicted from a house that he was staying at when the owners realized that he was touching their nine-year-old granddaughter. They did not inform the police because they wanted to spare their granddaughter further trauma. Aside from one failed relationship with an adult woman, he made no other attempts to set himself on the course to a normal, law-abiding life. Black lost his job soon after, and he returned to Kinloch Leven, where he lodged with a married couple who had a six-year-old daughter. Within a year, Black's landlords informed police that he had repeatedly attacked their daughter. He pleaded guilty to three counts of indecent assault against a child. He was sentenced to a year at Pullman, which specialized in training and rehabilitating of serious youthful offenders. Although he spoke freely about every aspect of his youth and adolescence, including the abuse he had suffered at Red House Care Home, he refused to discuss Pullman, and all he said was that he had vowed to never be imprisoned again. This has led to speculation that he may have been brutalized there. In September 1968, six months after his release from Pullman, Black moved to London, where he initially found lodgings in a bed set close to King's Cross. Between 1968 and 1970, he supported himself through various, often casual jobs, one of these being a lifeguard, where he was soon fired for touching a young girl, but no charges were ever brought. 
As Black was a keen photographer, he also sometimes discreetly photographed children, mostly girls, between 8 and 12, at locations such as swimming pools, and he stored these images alongside his other material in locked suitcases. Black frequented the Three Crowns, a Stamford Hill pub. There he met a Scottish couple, Edward and Cathy Rayson. In 1972, he moved into their attic. The Raisins consider Black a responsible, if somewhat reclusive, tenant, who gave them no cause for a complaint beyond his poor hygiene. Black remained their lodger until he was arrested in July 1990. He started working as a van driver for a London-based company. His job was to deliver poster advertisements across the country. This would allow him to strike in random, remote areas, Unlike other serial killers who make the jobs of detectives slightly easier by operating within a defined geographical radius, Black clearly planned his crimes meticulously. He had the right job. He had the right vehicle, a van whose back windows could be blocked with black curtains. He even invested in different kinds of spectacles to crudely disguise himself in his new surroundings. His first victim was nine-year-old Jennifer Cardi. Cardi was last seen by her mother at 1.40 p.m. as she cycled to her friend's house in Balnaderry, County Antrim, and she never arrived. She was abducted, attacked, and murdered on August 12, 1981. Cardi's bicycle was discovered less than a mile from her home. A search aided by 200 volunteers found nothing further. A week later... Cardi's body was found in a reservoir near a lay-by in Hillsborough, 16 miles away from her home. The autopsy concluded that she had died of drowning, most likely accompanied by ligature strangulation. The watch she had been wearing stopped at 5.40 p.m. Black's second confirmed victim was 11-year-old Susan Clare Maxwell, who lived on Cornhill on Tweed on the English side of, of the Scottish and English border. Maxwell was abducted on July 30th, 1982, as she walked home from playing tennis in Coldstream. She was last seen alive at 4.30pm, crossing the bridge over the River Tweed and was likely abducted by Black shortly after. The following day, a search was mounted, search dogs were used, and at peak, 300 officers were assigned full-time, and a thorough search was made of every property in both Cornhill and Coldstream, and over 80 square miles of terrain was also searched. Several people reported having seen a white van in the local vicinity. One said a van had parked in a fieldway gate off of A697. On August 12th, Maxwell's body was found by a lorry driver, 264 miles away from where she had been abducted. Maxwell had been found tied up, and her underwear had been removed. However, due to the decomposition, the precise date and cause of her death could not be determined. However, this gave a clue that the killer may have been some kind of traveling businessman or delivery driver. In 1983, Black preyed on his youngest victim, five-year-old Caroline Hogg. She disappeared whilst playing outside her Beach Lane home in the Edinburgh suburbs of Portobello. Witnesses reported seeing a disheveled, balding man with thick spectacles following Hogg to a fairground and then leading her away by her hand. This ensued the largest search in Scottish history at the time, with 2,000 local volunteers and 50 members of the Royal Scots Fusiliers, searching first Portobello, then expanding their scope to all of Edinburgh. By July 10th, Hogg's disappearance was headline news across the UK. Nine known pedophiles were identified as having been in Portobello on July 8th. However, they were all eliminated from the inquiry. On July 18th, Hogg's body was found in a ditch close to the M1 motorway, 310 miles from where she had been abducted, and just 24 miles from where Maxwell's body was found the previous year. The precise cause of death could not have been determined due to the extent of the decomposition. Detectives concluded that Hogg's and Maxwell's murders were the same person. At around 7.50pm, on March 26, 1986, 
Ten-year-old Sarah Jane Harper disappeared from the Leeds suburb of Morley, having left her home to buy a loaf of bread from a corner shop, only a hundred yards away from her home. The owner of the shop confirmed that Harper had bought a loaf of bread and two packets of crisps at 7.55, and that a balding man had briefly entered the shop moments later, and then left as Harper made her purchases. Sarah Harper was last seen alive by two girls walking into an alleyway leading towards her home. When she had not returned by 8.20, her mother Jackie and younger sister Claire briefly searched their surrounding streets before Jackie Harper reported her daughter missing to the police. Immediately, an extensive search was launched to find the child. Over 100 police officers were assigned full-time to the search, which saw house-to-house -house inquiries across Morley, and over 3,000 properties searched, and more than 10,000 leaflets were distributed, and there were about 1,400 witness statements obtained. A police search of the surrounding land was bolstered by 200 local volunteers. Due to extensive inquiries by the police, it was established that a white Ford transit van was in the area when Harper was abducted. On April 19th, a man discovered Sarah's partially dressed and tied up body floating in the River Trent near Nottingham, 71 miles from the site of her abduction. An autopsy showed that she had died between five and eight hours after she was last seen alive, and that the cause of death was drowning. Injuries that she had received to her face, forehead, neck, and head had most likely rendered her unconscious prior to being thrown into the water. Harper had also been a victim of a very violent and sustained attack prior to being thrown in the river. This was now a national manhunt. Following the murder of Sarah Harper, six police forces were now involved in the hunt for the offender. With the help of the FBI, they composed a psychological profile for the murderer. This profile described the killer as a white male aged between 30 and 40, most likely closer to 40, who was a classic loner. This offender would be unkempt in appearance and received less than 12 years of formal education. He is likely to live alone in rented accommodation in a lower-class neighborhood. They suspected that the killer would keep trophies. On April 23, 1988, an attempted abduction of a teenage girl occurred in Nottingham, which was not initially deemed by the police to be linked to the three child killings and thus remained unreported to the Clark or senior investigators in the national manhunt. The victim of this attempted abduction was Teresa Thornhill, a 15-year-old girl who is 4 foot 11, which may have led Black to think she was younger than what she was. Black was arrested in Stow on July 14, 1990. David Harkins, a 53-year-old retired postmaster, was mowing his front garden when he saw a blue transit van slow to a standstill across the road. This man happened to literally see Black in the act of bundling this little girl into his van. The postmaster immediately ran to tell the child's mother, but it looked like the kidnapper had gotten away. Then, to everyone's shock, the van reappeared in the area, causing the police officers to leap into its path. The officer who accessed the van and rescued the young gag victim from inside the sleeping bag happened to be the girl's own father. Robert Black attempted to pass it off as a rush of blood to the head, an unpremeditated, spontaneous act, but police soon realized he was a likely suspect for the murders that had appalled and frustrated detectives throughout the UK and that they had painstakingly pieced together all the circumstantial evidence against Black, including petrol receipts, that placed him close to where the girls had vanished. So much paperwork was amassed that lorries were required to transport 22 tons of material to the court. In Black's van, they found restraining devices including assorted ropes, sticking plaster, and hoods, a Polaroid camera, and numerous articles of girls' clothing, and a mattress. The police also searched where he was staying, and it yielded a large collection of certain child material in magazines, books, photographic, and video format, including 58 videos and films. They found several more items of children's clothing and a semen-stained copy of the Nottingham newspaper de detailing the 1988 attempted abduction of Teresa Thornhill. Black claimed that on his long-distance deliveries, he would pull into a lay-by and dress in the children's clothing. 
Black pled not guilty. In 1994, Black was convicted for the murders of Susan, Caroline, and Sarah. Black was given a life sentence. Jennifer Cardi's murder was not linked to the other murders until 2009. He was found guilty of Jennifer's murder in 2011. He died in 2016 as a result of a heart attack. He was aged 68. Cold case detectives were just weeks away from charging Robert Black with the abduction and murder of Devon paper girl Jeanette Tate. Jeanette disappeared whilst delivering newspapers shortly after 3 p.m. on Saturday, August 19, 1978. At approximately 3.28, two of her school friends saw Jeanette walking along, pushing her bicycle. They conversed briefly, and then her friends went into the lane. Seven minutes later, the two girls discovered her bicycle lying in the middle of the road. Several newspapers she had been scheduled to deliver were scattered across the tarmac. In August 2008, the Crown Prosecution Service decided that there was not enough evidence to charge Black with Jeanette's murder. After Black's conviction in 2011 for the murder of Jennifer Cardi, a spokesman for police service of Northern Ireland commented on the striking similarities between the murder of Cardi and the disappearance of Jeanette Tate. Devon and Cornwall Police reviewed the case in 2016 in hoping to find sufficient evidence to prosecute Black. At the time of Black's death in January 2016, they were only five weeks away from submitting a file to the Crown Prosecution Service in which they sought a new decision on whether to prosecute Black. The file was submitted in April 2016, and the Crown Prosecution Service said due to Black's death, there would be no posthumous decision to charge him with Jeanette's murder. Sadly, Jeanette's body has never been found, and Jeanette's dad passed away in April 2020, age 77, with the case still being unsolved. His final wish was to give Jeanette a dignified Christian burial and be buried alongside her. I'm going to go over some other possible victims. The first one is April Fab, who disappeared on April 8, 1969, in Norfolk, England. As you can tell by the bicycle, it seems definitely similar to Jennifer Cardi's murder and Jeanette Tate's disappearance. I've done a video on this if you want to check it out. I'll link it down in the description. Suzanne Lawrence, who was just 14 at the time of her disappearance, was last seen in North London, just a few miles away from where Robert Black lived. A orange and pink woven bracelet that was found in Black's home could belong to Lawrence as she was wearing a bracelet at the time of her disappearance. Former officers are calling for the bangle to be tested for traces of DNA. If DNA matches, this could potentially solve a 40-year-old unsolved murder. Another possible suspect is Mary Boyle, who disappeared in 1977. Black was known to have done deliveries and also frequented local pubs in the area. Here are some photos of some other possible victims. Thank you so much for watching today's video. Make sure you stay safe and follow my social media for more. Also, it would mean a lot to me if you could subscribe. Thanks so much. Bye!